Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. G'day, welcome to the Australian Property Podcast, our weekly two cents segment. I'm Pete Wargent from Alan Wargent Property Buyers and I'm here with Chris Bates from Flint Group. Batesy, how's your week been? Oh, things are going well here, Pete. Um, yeah, it's just a bit of a knuckle down before we're going to Bali for a couple of weeks uh, next week on Monday. So that should be fun. We're going with my mum and my sister and for her 60th and 40th and um, some friends. I've got a villa, so that, sh- that should be fun. But uh, it fe- oh, it still feels a long way away. We've still got a couple of weeks of work to get, well, 10 days of work to get through. So how's things going over there? You have to keep the kids out of the home office in case they trash your... Uh your uh, set up there but uh yeah it's um, i mean that was I a think... funny story before this right pete i just said that to you i come into my office I, my standing desk isn't working i'm not sure why that's not working i can't find my my speak my headphones aren't working my i don't know i couldn't find anything and i figured out what had happened the kids had broken in and um destroyed the place and to fix yeah, the standing my kids desk have, I've actually uh... got, yeah. Yeah, my kids got me this thing for my office door, which is like a traffic light system. And if it's on red, you don't come in because I'm doing TV or recording. And if it's on green, you can come in. Well, yeah, suffice to say it doesn't work. And uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> so if we get any unwelcome guests during the recording, apologies in advance. But yeah, yeah it's uh, all good this end. No, no trips to Bali lined up, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I have uh, made the trip over to Europe. And uh, yeah, looking forward to a a visit to see Spurs uh, fairly soon down at the new Tottenham Health Spurs Stadium. It's probably not actually that new anymore. So, uh, yeah, just a bit of European summer to look forward to. So, um, yeah, so let's crack into our three stories this week. There's been a bit going on with the budget and then the budget reply and all the other stuff that's going on in the world. So a um, bit of a, an election battleground Brewing, I suppose there's a, a UK election actually coming up 4th of July, they announced today. And uh, I guess Australia is going to have one in the next 12 months. So we'll look a bit around some of the proposals, particularly around immigration cuts. Uh, secondly, uh, Scotty Pape, the barefoot investor, uh, some advice for over leveraged borrowers. I think um, as unemployment rises, we'll probably see more people get into mortgage stress. I think um, mortgage arrears so far have been very low, but that's because everybody's who wants a job has got a job and that will obviously change at some point. Uh, so we'll take a bit of a look at um, Scott's advice, always um, a level-headed type of guy and commentator. And then thirdly, yeah, the Reserve Bank, Sarah Hunter, did a very interesting speech down in Hobart on the dwelling shortage and some of the drivers of supply and demand. And it's not all about interest rates, as she pointed out. So where should we start? Um, well, I saw in the budget reply, immigration crackdown, so Peter Dutton of the coalition has proposed to cut immigration in the short term by about 25%. Um, also, some other sort of semi-populist measures, a two-year ban on foreigners buying established homes, which doesn't really move the needle, but it, it might just be a good virtue signalling move. Um, and um, I suppose, I, I guess, well, the proposal is essentially to cut the permanent migration programme from 185,000 to 140,000 into Australia for the first couple of years. And I suppose it's just recognising the urgency of the housing crisis. So, um, but I think, well, I guess what politicians say they're going to do and what they actually do doesn't always line up. But what did you take on it, Chris? I just wonder, is that all going to be students or are they going to hit uh, across the board migration? And, you know, yes, we've got less people coming to the country, but were those people going to help us build the housing that we needed to house them, right? Um, and I think there was a bit of an argument of that is that we actually have a skill shortage. So we actually do need more labour, particularly in everything that's going to be around building, you know, and um, just because of the competition for resources from the government, for the commercial sector to um, and taking away uh, the resi sector. You know, building costs and labour have gone up dramatically. What we actually want is the opposite. We want a, a lot of people willing to work in this segment to sort of bring labour costs down and then we can actually start to build again and then that'll help our crisis. So I think it's, um, I mean, it does sound great, right? I'm doing something, I'm slowing down, but what that is actually going to do is take a little bit off our rental markets and where our um, potentially overseas, um, you know, students uh, would move to when they move here. But does that slow down demand for property and people wanting to buy? Not really. 
maybe in a few years' time. But as you saw in COVID, did cutting when migration was zero, did house prices fall? Absolutely not, right? And so um, that that linkage has been proven a couple of years ago when everyone thought, oh, COVID's going to make house prices fall because no one's going to move here. It's just not the way it works just because of pent-up demand and um, internal demographics within our country. I think the opposite of that is actually the Liberal policy is actually going to pump up property prices because their access to super is going to create a very similar environment in, say, that was like in Sydney um, and New South Wales when, uh, you know, Dominic Perrottet changed the access to no stamp duty up to 1.5 million. So, you know, we spoke about it a lot back then and we knew ex- exactly what would happen when that policy would come in is you would bring forward demand because what you're allowing first home buyers to do is buy now rather than buy later because they didn't have to pay stamp duty. So their deposit hurdle reduced dramatically. It went from 15% to 10% or 10% down to 5%. And we saw a huge increase in first home buyer demand. And that was very quickly factored into prices. You know, properties that should have sold at 1.3 million or 1.35 sold for 1.5 million on the nose. And that happened um, very quickly, particularly because Labor were likely to win that next election. And everyone thought, if I don't do it now, I won't do it. And I think the same thing will happen with super. If you allow people to access 50,000 or their whole super or, you know, I'm not exactly sure how the policy is going to look, to be honest, but if you then do that for one and maybe a couple, that deposits dramatically increase plus what they've got in savings, plus they can rattle the tin around family and bang, they can buy now versus potentially not being able to enter the market. And um, I absolutely think that would very quickly jump prices way bigger than any cut to migration. Yes. So the proposal from the coalition, uh, the idea is to free up 100,000 homes over the course of five years uh, versus what would otherwise be the case. But as you said, there are other housing policies. So in the 2022 uh, ill-fated election campaign, they took a proposal where first home buyers could withdraw up to 40% of their superannuation or $50,000 cap, I think it was, um, and then use that to buy their first home. Now, as it um, stands, it sounds as though uh, the coalition is um, thinking of running with the idea of first home buyers being allowed to access all of their super. And as you said, I think if you if you take the scenario where cause a lot of young people don't have much in their super, but Deloitte did some modelling on this where they said, right, okay, you get two 30-year-olds and they withdraw 35 grand each and they take that away and use it as a deposit for their first home. Now, Deloitte have argued that um, that couple could retire with $195,000 less in today's dollars. Now, you and I have done enough modeling over the years to know you can make the numbers say whatever you want. I mean, it can, uh, depends who's asking for the report, I suppose, and you can torture those figures until they confess. I, I think uh, conceptually that does make sense. I think if you if you think about um, a very effective, Tax efficient investment in your super fund. I, I think that would that would probably equate to a better outcome potentially. But it's not all about uh, just the dollars. It's whether you know people can get access to the housing market sooner as well. And obviously, the coalition thinks this is a vote winner uh, because it's one of the reasons they're going with it. But I do wonder whether that would more than offset on a net basis any cuts to immigration because it would pump up demand for first home buyers, as you say. Yeah, I think the uh, election odds are right now about dollar fifty to Labor, two fifty to the coalition. Um, I do kind of laugh whenever I look at those because I've going back to Brexit and Trump and so many and the uh, the twenty nineteen election. How wrong they got it, um, the odds. And so I, I always take them with a grain of salt now. But it is likely Labor are going to win. But is this policy going to completely shift the market? Um, and maybe it doesn't just create first home buyers, but does it create? Other people in the property market go, I know that's going to pump up prices for me and do I do I vote with self-interest? Um, even though uh, you'd like to think people don't, obviously people do, right? Because as soon as the budget comes out or each year, it's like what's in it for me is, is the mentality after every budget. So you could easily see a policy like this swing a lot of votes. So um, yeah, I do think the migration thing is a bit of a headline tracker and I do think we need to be careful with that rhetoric around the world. You can't be like turning it on and off. Like we need to be a country that wants people to move here, that we're including, we're a multicultural society, that we want talent from all around the world to move here. We can't then just cut it off and uh, and treat people like we did in COVID, if, if I'm honest. And so 
Um, I think we're going to be really careful, and especially around universities and things like that. Yeah, we've got a good thing going here on where we are uh, on an international stage rated highly, but that's complacency. If, if you think that we're always going to be the best in the world, then that's obviously just a, uh, a slippery slope. It is. Um, so Dutton basically said that Labour would bring 1.7 million people into the country over the next five years. Uh, so that's net migration, which includes the temporary migrants, as you say. Uh, but some of those will end up becoming long-term uh, arrivals as well, I suppose. And Labour's counterpoint, well, this could have cost the economy billions because of skill shortages, reduction in headline GDP and so on. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, a week's a long time in politics, as they say, and uh, we're probably a year away from the next election. But that, that's going to be something that heats up a bit because um, I think if you look to the rest of the budget, there wasn't really much to indicate that the housing supply shortage is going to be tackled uh, anytime soon, really. So I think it's, it will still be a key issue come the next election. Um, so somewhat related story, Chris, for number two. Um, so Scott Pape in the Australian uh, Barefoot's advice to the heavily leveraged. So I think um, one of the reasons this is sort of come to the fore is the interest rate cuts are obviously going to be further away than was thought last year. I think uh, last year people were thinking that rates would be on their way down by the middle of this year, and now they're not. I think it's they're getting pushed further and further out. Um, now, the budget did sort of um, – there's a few things. We've got tax cuts starting 1 July, so that helps a little bit for people in mortgage stress. Um, there's also energy subsidies at the state level and at the federal level, so every household gets $300. There's no means testing, so that kind of helps a bit. And then uh, there's rent assistance for people in the rental market. And I think um, Lucy Ellis from Westpac made a, a good point, actually, that although uh, this is somewhat artificially reducing inflation, essentially just a, a subsidy or a handout, um, I think it could actually work um, in, in, with some second order effects because, um, as Lucy Ellis pointed out, um, quite a lot of other things in the economy are indexed to the rate of inflation. So there's that kind of second order impact. But also, if people are experiencing lower increases in their actual cost of living, that feeds back in somehow to consumer inflation expectations. And then I suppose thirdly and importantly, uh, later in the year when these changes come into full effect, most likely unemployment is going to be higher than where it is today. It's about 4.1%. Um, I think Scott's point though is that there's some borrowers out there now who are paying maybe 50% of their income servicing their mortgage. And um, if interest rates aren't coming down anytime soon, you really need to be uh, taking some measures to address that. And uh, his advice in summary was basically, if you're going to panic, the best time to panic is early. Um, wh what are you seeing, Chris? Are you seeing many stressed borrowers out there? I mean, normally we'd say when you get full employment, yes, you might have some people who are having to cut back, but they're not going to go into mortgage arrears because they're still employed. But are you seeing any signs of that out there? Look, we've still got a lot of people coming off fixed. And, um, you know, I can think of even a conversation yesterday and a client a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's a bit of a case-by-case -case basis. You know, like the client yesterday, yeah, they're uh, losing quite a bit of cash flow, but they're in a really strong position. Their house is paid off and they've just got a lot of investment properties and in the, they can sustain that cash flow because they've got buffers. If I go to comparing that to a client a few weeks ago, I mean, they leveraged up pretty hard, not with us in fairness, um, uh, in 2020, 2021. And they bought a house um, down sort of, you know, near Melbourne and it was just getting too much. Their income just didn't rise much over those last few years. If anything, they've come back. Their mortgage repayment's gone through the roof. And, um, you know, for them, it's like, do we really want this nicer house or would we be happy with something a little bit um, less nice? Uh, and with a smaller mortgage. And they ended up being able to do it quite well. They ended up selling their place, getting out of the market, and then re-entering at a you know about 800 grand less than what they sold for. And um, you know, that then, you know, because even though their incomes had gone back and their borrowing capacity reduced, they were still able to get into a good asset. And so, yeah, maybe is not as good in fairness, but um, they were they've got a lot more peace of mind. So we absolutely have seen that happen. Surprisingly, though, the people who absolutely leveraged up hard, particularly in our clients in 2020, 2021, I even got a text message from one this morning, um, you know, they're doing well financially. They went into that, you know, environment, even though they knew interest rates were low and prices were high, 
they went in there and thought, well, I really back myself from an income point of view over the next three to four years. And yes, inf- uh, unemployment's going up, but I'm for- it's not actually hitting them often. And often their incomes have gone up dramatically. And so, yes, their uh, mortgage repayments have gone up, but their wages and their income as a family have gone up. Yes, there's going to be those case-by-case basis where people are, are struggling, and uh, but we've got very few clients in arrears. And I don't actually think we've got anyone on a payment holiday. There was one client last year that was um, one of our older clients, I guess, getting closer to retirement that leveraged up in 2021 and, um, uh, you know, because uh, kids were finishing school and they wanted to move location. Um, But, you know, other than that, I can't think of too many others that have gone all the way through to the banks and the banks will absolutely step in um, and, and help, you know. And so if you are getting into that situation, yes, you can panic, which is what Scott's saying. The first thing you want to be doing while you're working is trying to get on top of your your mortgages and trying to increase your loan terms and increase buffers because if something does happen to your work, then your ability to borrow money completely evaporates. And so if you've got the ability of just taking a bit of risk off the table by building a buffer, you know, not lowering your rate, your rate, yeah, rates aren't as good as they were 18 months ago. So refinancing for rate reasons might not be the reason you do it. You just do it for a restructuring and a buffer creating reason, what a, a reducing your repayments because you extended your loan term, and B maybe releasing a bit of equity. And so, you can definitely do that. Um, look, don't also rent rush to sell. Look, there are other options potentially where you can rent the property out. You know, reduce your living costs, claim the negative gearing benefits. Maybe that's you can afford to still keep the property in that environment versus selling because if things do get better for you financially and interest rates start to reduce then potentially you got through that danger zone by making some lifestyle changes, maybe even moving in with family. I can think of one client that's done that. Um, got them through that that danger zone um, and then you're able to move back into the property and you didn't have to worry about selling costs, the market running on you, stamp duty again, et cetera. So, yeah, panic, but that doesn't mean you should rush to sell. Indeed. And Scott's point is just ask yourself some questions. What would happen if you lost your job? What happens if you get sick or if interest rates go up? Now, interestingly, um, just over recent weeks, um, the market was flirting with the idea of more interest rate hikes, but that's kind of got priced out again. I think there's been a range of data that's kind of pushed that away again. I think the jobs figures, although we're still creating jobs, unemployment's now clearly trending higher. I think the wages figures are on the way back down now. Wages growth for the private sector and the public sector seems to have peaked. And I think if you just look around the world, it's interesting. Uh, Canada's got its un- unemployment rate uh, sort of heading up pretty quickly now, and inflation's back towards two and a half percent or so. UK the same, Eurozone the same. So I think, um, yeah, I think most likely the Reserve Bank's going to be on hold. And there are a few things that will start to work in your favour, things like tax cuts and hopefully a pay rise come one July for some people. Um, for some landlords, rents are still going up. Um, so, yeah, if you can hang in there, that's great. But, um, yeah, it's definitely worth uh, taking some practical measures to do what you can because, uh, yeah, there's still definitely some households under stress out there. Yeah, absolutely. So we should move on to um, story number three, Pete, around the RBA and just some of their uh, almost obvious uh, observations on the market. Yeah, pretty good uh, speech. It was down in Hobart um, just a week ago. Uh, Sarah Hunter, who's the assistant Governor Economic at the RBA. And um, yeah, it's been interesting uh, graphs and charts. I think um, one of the uh, the key points that she made is that if you look at the drivers of underlying demand for housing, we used to get about 2.8 persons per household if you went back to the 1980s. Well, now it's 2.5. Uh, so that's the, one of the things is that we effectively need more homes per person than we used to. I think another thing that's changed since 2019 uh, some interesting stats that um, pulled from the ABS. I think if you look uh, pre-pandemic, about 31% of people with a job were working from home at some point over the month, not all the time necessarily. Now, obviously, during the pandemic, that figure went crazy and spiked because we were forced to work from home. And it has come back down, but it's still only back down to around about 35%. So um, I guess as a corollary of that, more people want more space. I think... Um, uh, I mean, you're working in your home office today, so am I. You know, we're just two examples of many, many people who are doing the same thing. 
And I think, um, I mean, there's a there's a range of good graphs, actually. We'll put a link in the show notes. But if you look at the underlying demand for houses at the moment, we need an extra about 300,000 per annum with the way population growth has been going. But we're building not a, well, just over half that. So I think eventually the housing supply shortage will get tackled. But at the moment, you've got construction insolvencies are at decade highs. I think we've had 2,300 over the past year. And as the RBA points out, new dwelling prices have absolutely rocketed. They've, I mean, they're, they're up, they've tripled since the turn of the century or thereabouts. And uh, prices of new dwellings have been going up ahead of inflation because of the cost of wages for construction workers, cost of materials. But since 2020, that's just absolutely taken a vertical leap. So at a time when the residential sector is really trying to compete for skilled uh, workers and construction workers and tradespeople uh, with the infrastructure sector where people are earning very, very high wages on some big projects and FIFO projects. There's, there's just so many things working against supply at the moment. And obviously, demand is very, very high. Yeah, the work from home thing, I think there's definitely a, a rhetoric where you're going back to the office. But I don't know if that means back to the office for five days for everyone. It's definitely mm. some type of hybrid. And um, I think that's part workers, but part employers. I think the, the workers are wanting to go back in a little bit to, you know, because particularly in the market and the economy and uh, isn't as booming, right? And you're less confident about your future, what you want to be seen um, so you can be heard and that you're not the one that gets the boot if there is some redundancy, right? And because you've got your mortgage. And um, so I think there's a bit of that as well. Workers are, are making the decision, look, I need to actually protect myself here. I need to show my face more just so I can, Prove my productivity and um, make sure I'm not part of the redundancies and uh, and then potentially give myself a better chance for a wage increase, which which I need. And so the average household thing is an interesting one. I, are we having less kids? Yeah, probably. But are we living longer? Are we preferring to live uh, more in our own places? You know, the multi generational families is that happening less than it did in the past? And it is a big thing because if you shift that back to 2.8, then we need you know, basically 10% less properties. Um, maybe that's our housing shortage sorted if we uh, started to increase. But to go from 2.5 to 2.8, I mean, it took us 30 years to to go down. It's going to take us 30 years to go back up um, and it won't happen overnight. And if anything, there's forces going the other way, right? You know, um, uh, when a couple dies and the widow, you know, survives and lives well into their 90s or 100 or a divorce happens or we only have one child because of, um, you know, the fears around house prices and, you know, the, the cost of actually having three or four kids. Um, so maybe that household size is going to keep reducing and uh, won't increase as an average. And, um, and do we keep living in our properties for longer and longer? And so you see the turnover rate gets lower. That's less supply. You see more less people per housing. That's less supply. And um, I think, I can't remember who it is, UDIA, I think it is. They've just released a report this week and talks around, um, you know, what, what you call it, an index where, you know, if it's over 100, that means we're building more than we need and under 100 means that we're building less than we need. And I think it's at a really uh, under 90. Um, so we're building way under what we need to. Perth was the only real city where we're trying to build, we're building more than we actually probably need. Um, but a lot of the other cities, um, particularly, uh, Sydney are really struggling. And so, yeah, it's not looking good for a lot of that supply metrics. And and that's what you need to slow prices down or price growth is you need listings and buildings to come. But all the things are kind of showing the opposite right now. Definitely, yeah. There's there's always more nuance to this, isn't there? We, we tend to think of the housing market, um, you know, people talk about supply and demand and then they divide the number of people in the country, 27.25 million then by the number of dwellings and use all these averages. But at, at the local level, the LGA level, there's so much going on. One of the things I've heard a bit about recently is people buying uh, city crash pads, you know, because they're working more time at home. But sometimes they're going to be in the office two or three days. And then, I, you know, maybe I'm going to live two hours from the office. And yeah, you get all this um, stuff and uh, holiday homes as well. So like the Sometimes just dividing the headline numbers doesn't get you the, the true picture. You need to look at the local level of what's going on. Chris, there's one other thing I wanted to touch on here. That's some of the uh, just doing the rounds on the chat forums. People have been posting their figures for land tax and uh, particularly in Victoria because of the changes 
the land taxes down there. And I think um, look, there's a bit um, there's a bit of to and fro on this, and some people might say, well, yes, but land taxes are high in other states as well, and da da da. I think what's different for Victoria is that the land taxes are kicking in at very very low levels now. So even for apartments, you're going to see land tax. Um, uh, started starting to kick in at very low levels and for some people with larger blocks i've seen some enormous figures for land tax like twenty thousand a year and so on and it's just interesting reading the discourse on social media i'd say overwhelmingly well certainly more than that uh, 50 percent of comments seem to be at the of the opinion well good frankly you know we don't need investors uh tell them to piss off to another state and so on which is um, there's certainly some sort of merit to that viewpoint, but I think the um, the other side to that is that in Australia anyway, without foreign investors around, new apartment projects aren't going to get built unless there's investors. That's my thinking because we don't build speculatively. I know some economists would say, well, land taxes don't stop you building, which is true, but you need to somebody to sell to. And I think if you look at approvals for units in Melbourne. I haven't got the stats in front of me, but I wouldn't mind taking a bet they're going to be at 15-year lows, essentially the lowest since the GFC. So I think, um, yes, on the one hand, you'll push some investors away and, and a home buyer might move in. But I, I do wonder about the uh, the sort of second order impact on uh, dwelling supply, at least in the short term. Yeah, I mean, um, we got a land tax bill for our place, to our house down in Brunswick, and um, absolutely, I was like, "Whoa!" And I quickly logged on and looked at the last few years, and it was dramatically higher. And it's at a time when investors are really probably struggling from a cash flow point of view. You know, like sometimes they're great for investors, right? And sometimes they're taking the hit to, because they're betting on the long term, right? And when you look at interest rates going through the roof, and yields have always been a bit lower in Melbourne, you know, like. So you've always had to potentially take a higher negative cash flow in Melbourne because you've uh, the yields are lower compared to you know by, say investing in Brisbane for example, and you're doing that because you believe in the long term growth story of Melbourne, you know restricted supply, growing population, um, and it being uh, one of the top cities in terms of economic right. And so at the moment, it's investors are saying, well, hang on a sec, you know, is that cash flow? That's just like maybe the the straw that broke the camel's back for some investors. Look. Ultimately, though, it's not the end of the world if you hang on from an investment point of view because if less investors go down there, then you're going to see yields go up. And that means rents are going to go up, right? And so rents will go up. That cash flow gets better every year because rents are going up. If, in, if interest rates start to fall again, that increases, um, you know, reduces your negative cash flow. And what it also does is creates a bit more of a rental crisis. And I think that's not the case in Melbourne, you know, because there was more relaxed building over you know the last 10, 20 years down there and they were building apartments for fun, there wasn't really that rental pressure. But you can look around the country and that is absolutely happening. If that happens in Melbourne, you're going to see that does, you know, renting's hard. Okay, maybe I should buy. You start to see some price growth. So that FOMO kicks into the market. Um, and then the owner occupiers and first home buyers are out there and buying and you can start to see some price growth. So you know, the investors now are just saying, right, I'm out of um, Melbourne because of this land tax. you just got to be a bit careful with you thinking a bit short-sighted here and going, well, actually, is this really bad for growth? If it means less investors and it's going to create more owner-occupier demand, is this going to, and less building, is it going to lead to price growth? And I think it will in time, particularly if you have something that suits the owner-occupier market and the family market rather than the rental market because as soon as the family market has rental stress, then they absolutely are forced to buy. If I can easily rent a house for my family, I just think, well, I can just consistently do this. Isn't it? There's no pressure for me to buy. I don't want to buy. I don't want a big mortgage under higher interest rates. But if I start to feel like my ability to rent something and I'm getting kicked out of a rental and then I can't find another, well, actually, you do everything you can to buy because you don't want to go through that, particularly when you've got kids. And so that's my take on Melbourne. I think we did an episode on it. Uh, maybe even last week or the week before. But, um, yeah, a lot of investors sometimes do get a little bit, um, think about the short term and the cash flow rather than the long term. And even yesterday, you know, I had to talk a client off selling a bunch of properties because of the negative cash flow. But when we did the numbers again, we said, well, actually, you're still well ahead per year at the moment because the growth is way bigger than your negative cash flow. Uh, And so I think that's just something to think about. I think if you jack up interest rates and land taxes and the cost of insurances have gone up, I think the the one thing you can say is that yields will have to rise. It doesn't matter whether that's a 
well, potentially it could be a function of lower prices or higher rents or a combination of the two. But one way or another, the rental yield is going to have to go up because that's just the way the market works. The yield finds its level. Um, and it probably, as you said, it probably depends on the property type and the location as to how that dynamic plays out. But yeah, there's, um, I think landlords will certainly be looking to pass on costs where they can in tight rental markets, but that won't, wouldn't apply right across the market. I think um, uh, kind of last point for today, for me anyway, is that I think there's there's going to be a narrative change, I think, in the second half of 2024. We've heard a lot about inflation over the last year or 18 months now. I just mentioned at the outset there, so Canada's got its inflation rate fell further than expected in April to 2.7%. And if you exclude gasoline, it's 2.5%. So basically back to target. And as I said before, unemployment in Canada, because they've been running very high population growth rates just like Australia. Well, unemployment is 6.1% in Canada. So that's pretty much the all clear now for the Bank of Canada. We'll start cutting rates next month. In the Eurozone, inflation is well under control there. Interest rates will start to fall over the next few weeks. Um, and in the UK, headline inflation is 2.3%. So biggest monthly decline in 45 years because of energy price changes. So again, I mean, 2.3% is within that, that 1% band that the Bank of England looks for. Now, yes, yeah, services inflation was still too hot and core inflation was still too hot. But obviously, the Conservative Party think that interest rate cuts are coming, hence why they called an election for the coming months. So they're trying to sell that good news story. Now, it's interesting to see, does Australia go more with the US where we struggle with that final piece of the puzzle to get inflation down to 3%? The, the government thinks they can do it by Christmas. Um, uh, the Reserve Bank thinks it might take a bit longer. And in New Zealand, uh, well, inflation is still 4% there and they're kind of at risk of torching the economy there because interest rates are pretty high. So I think that's... Um, going to be the big story for the second half of the year is that we're going to see Canada and then the Eurozone and potentially the UK cutting interest rates. And does the rest of the world move in the same direction or is inflation going to stick around? Yeah, I think the reason this is so important is sentiment does drive prices. You know, it does give it a bit of a turbo kick or it slows it down. And, you know, I think it definitely had a period there maybe two months ago, maybe only a month ago, to be honest, where a lot of that news was quite negative in terms of inflation and, you know, a few pieces of data points were surprising people and the expectations of where rates were going completely shifted again. It went from rate cuts to happening this year or early next to late next. And, you know, that did absolutely affect um, our buyer demand and it did put a bit of fear into some of our property owners around their mortgages. But what it did do, which a lot of people don't think about, is it affects people who are thinking about upgrading. And this is what we saw. So, People who are in the market who have got a property said, oh, maybe I shouldn't upgrade right now. Maybe I should sit on the sideline. And what that does is reduce listings later in the year because they're saying, well, I'm not going to bother getting my place tidied up for sale because we're not going to sell it this year. We're going to park that decision to next year. We're going to see what happens. And that happened at the wrong time. You know, usually you want to be um, preparing your property a few months before you want to list. And when you want to list, it's usually around that August to September, not even really October, to be honest, personally. And so if you're getting a few months before that, it's kind of now, right? And so if you've then gone and haven't booked your trades in and you parked that idea, then you're probably not going to list in spring and you're going to be thinking to autumn next year. And coincidentally, just in the last two or three weeks, oh, some great data points have come back in terms of where inflation's going. Oh, maybe those rate cuts are going to happen at the start of next year again. And um, and even the uh, uh, ASX trackers, like, well, maybe there's a 10% cut coming right a 10 percent chance where that was zero just that um even a week a couple of weeks ago and so um yeah i think that sentiment is shifting and i think what was driving the market at the start of 2024 was that real more positive sentiment on where rates are going to go that calmed down um maybe in april but i think it's picking up again if we start to see some better data particularly over this next three months because if we're hitting we're hitting the winter zone right where listings really crash in june july school holidays you know, a lot of properties don't look great in winter. They're not great to sell in winter um, because of their aspect or location and open houses on a weekend, the house is cold and blah, blah, blah. So you always see, and, and a lot of agents go on holidays um, in fairness as well and, and buyers. So the, the listings are going to dry up. They're not going to come back till August. 
And so we're talking maybe a two or three months of low listings and does do buyer demand increase like it can do over the Christmas time? Um, and then there's a lower listings because of when this rate fear came out in April. And that's to me, H, second half of this year, that would that would be what I would think we're going to see. Um, and that could be absolutely turbocharged if that rate news uh, or inflation news gets much more positive than people are expecting. And um when it was in that heat of, you know, where rates are going and it's going to be high for longer, I was like, well, just be careful because sentiment can shift in in days. And I, I feel like it has just over the last week. Well, certainly market pricing has. And I think as well, media narratives. I think if you look at the US, uh, there's obviously an election brewing over there as well. And there's a lot of talk about, well, we've beaten inflation, which the stats don't really back up, but people are pushing that narrative. And I guess uh, UK, Australia, we've all got elections coming up. So, yeah, definitely be a media push. Um, so, look, that's about it for this week. I've just remembered my new book is out this week. So keep an eye out for that in the bookstores, The Buy Right Approach to Property Investing uh, by Kate Bakos and me. And, uh, Chris, you must be getting your uh, Bintang singlet ready for the Instagram photos. So uh, yeah, don't forget to send us your holiday snaps when you get over to Bali. I've never been to Bali before. It sounds like I'm not Australian until I can say I've been <laughs> there. And um, absolutely, I'll take a selfie for you in a bin tang. I won't be drinking a bin tang, still the, the sober as can be. But um, yeah, I've been to lots of countries once. I've not been to many countries twice. So it's going to be interesting to see if I want to go back to Bali um, because I do like to just explore and try things. I think it's a stage of life thing, two young kids, the adventurous holidays that I love, uh, India, Africa, all sorts of areas like that. Um a few years away for us so we're doing the boring sit on a beach maybe use a bit of kids club and um you know swim in the pool which is not as exciting enough for me but hopefully i get some rest and recuperation um it's been a big three months since the launch and uh yeah it's been a lot of personal growth and business growth to, to deal with and um yeah i'm looking forward to, to relaxing it could be worse, yes. And uh, yeah, as usual, if you've got any questions for us, or if you're looking for a mortgage or you want a buyer's agent, of course, you can always contact us in the show notes. So yeah, look forward to your break, Chris, and uh, look forward to chatting again soon as well. And should we give away a couple of books for free, Pete? I've stitched you up here. What should we uh, <laughs> give away a few for some good questions? If we get a couple of good questions, maybe yeah, we, we can free, actually. a few books yeah, in, yeah, the, we... uh, in the kitty there. Yeah, we do actually have a fair few boxes sitting around. So, yeah, send us in a few questions and uh, be nice and we might send you a free book. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Enjoy Europe and uh, we'll have another good chat next week. Cheers. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing and so much more.